Welcome to Our State, a production of UNC-TV in association with Our State magazine. For over 70 years, bringing the wonders of North Carolina to readers across the state. On this edition, the rich history represented at Somerset Place. The transformation of downtown Siler City by a group of enterprising artists and some of the many surprises being dug up on the Army base at Fort Bragg. From Manio to Murphy and all the small towns and big cities in between, BB&T believes opportunity lives everywhere in North Carolina. It's a belief we've held for more than 130 years and guides us as we support our communities from the mountains to the coast. We love calling North Carolina home, and we're proud to provide major funding for our state. Quality public television is made possible through the financial contributions of viewers like you, who invite you to join them in supporting UNC-TV. It is 1843. The place you live is quiet, tranquil even, out in the country, not far from Edenton. Some 50 buildings, including your home, are clustered around the northeastern edge of Lake Phelps on a generous tract of land called Somerset Place. Everything you need is practically at hand. Much of it grown on your 67,000 acres of cultivated land. And there are plenty of people here to help, in the fields and around the house. You are perhaps the third largest slaveholder in North Carolina. Your name is Josiah Collins III, or Mary Collins, his wife. You have a good life, a loving family, and hundreds of slaves. By 1843, the slave trade had been flourishing for years, and it was considered a sound business proposition for white planters to purchase and put to work enough Negroes for their plantation to make a profit. But what if you were one of the enslaved people? Perhaps a woman named Suki Davis, acquired when she was about 14, a number of years earlier. She was purchased in 1786 from Edenton and bought here at a time that this was a developing plantation, a developing business. The plantation system, planting, harvesting crops, um, much of the way you think of futures today in the stock market, all of that was contingent upon having enough laborers to, in fact, produce a profit for a planter. So it was a part of the economic system of America at that time. And young women really needed to ensure that the enslaved population regenerated. In other words, she was here young enough to begin bearing children and bear children she did, eight in all, followed by numerous Suki Davis descendants. And she probably started out clearing fields, washing, cooking, doing a myriad of kinds of things. And by 1843, she was a great grandmother and her responsibilities in the field or for work would have ceased, she would have been too old. So we can imagine her as this venerated family elder, community elder, matriarch of a tremendously large family. But dark clouds were gathering on the distant horizon. Little did the Collinses or anyone else know back in 1843 that the slave economy would soon vanish in the stinging smoke of civil war. The entire plantation system in the South collapsed after the Civil War. By December of 1865, 
the then ex-slaves left the plantation. The plantation remained in the hands of the Collins family until early 1880, but this place was designed to be supported by enslaved laborers. And once the institution of slavery was gone, it couldn't be sustained. Today, the 31-acre tract of Somerset Place that remains is a state historic site and part of Washington County's Pettigrew State Park. Remnants of the plantation's original canal network can still be seen. They connected the lake with a nearby river and were used for transport and irrigation, all dug and maintained, of course, by the slaves. The Collins home still stands, as do a few other buildings, some original, some not, that provide visitors a brief glimpse of life as it was here in 1843. A study in contrasts. You won't visit another historic site, plantation site, that affords a visitor an opportunity to really understand the differences in the way people on different social and economic levels lived in North Carolina in 1843. You tour Sookie Davis's home. You tour the planter's home. And you don't really have to do a lot of commenting. People understand completely. Four or five people lived in the comparatively huge Collins home. And that was enough space for 188 of the enslaved people, given the size of their homes. But the plantation home also was where Mary Collins kept the books. Most women in her position were content with gardening, setting the menus, and so forth. But Mary also had a good business head, and she used it. She was educated, smart woman, who became her husband's clerk, which meant that she was maintaining the plantation records. And that wasn't true of most Southern women. By law, they couldn't be educated any more than blacks could be educated. I tend to think of Mary Collins as an atypical in terms of what we've come to believe about planters' wives. Their home, however, was typical of the era. And so were the enslaved people's homes. This particular home represents three two-story, four-room buildings that were here in 1843. And even though there were four rooms, each of the four rooms was counted as a cabin so that you'd have an entire family living in one space. All the other 24 people lived here, but it, nothing like what we think of as living space now with an upstairs for bedrooms and a downstairs. The reality of each day for an enslaved person is that there were degrees of non-freedom on the antebellum plantation, represented at Somerset Place by a lovely white picket fence. If you were a house servant, then you could cross the fence and be on the inside of the fence with the owner's family. If you were a field hand or an artisan, you really did have to stop at the fence. If you wanted to get word inside, you had to pass that word to one of the house servants who would then, if they chose to, pass the word on. They're not just physical barriers, they are psychological barriers too, symbolic barriers. And if someday you decided that you'd had enough and made your break for freedom, it was likely that you would soon be back and life would become even more unbearable. There were acts of defiance that began from the moment the plantation was settled, and there were men consistently running away. Native Africans here chose suicide and walked into the lake and drowned themselves. So resistance was always a part of the institution of slavery. One of the young women who lived here, a Rebecca Drew, at 14, tried to run away. She was caught and put in the stocks overnight. Uh, the night turned bitter cold. Her feet became frozen and had to be amputated. Young Rebecca's injuries would have been attended to in the plantation hospital, 
after which she was still expected to perform minor tasks. Josiah Collins's investment in Somerset's hospital was simply a matter of protecting his investment. Absolutely no expense was spared in protecting the health of an enslaved person, and it was prudent. The physician who worked here, Dr. Hardy Hardison, was a trained white physician who kind of rode circuit, and he served the plantations that were here at Lake Phelps. He is the same physician who served the Collins family. Chloe was an enslaved woman who was a nurse. And at times when the physician wasn't here, then she was in charge and left to care for everyone in the hospital. 